Okay, welcome everybody. Um, on behalf of my father, Rabbi Kelman, and the rest of the Torah in Motion team, I'm very happy to welcome you to tonight's parsha here. Um, before we begin, also just wanted to point your attention to the Hanukkah series that's coming up. I'm starting already this Sunday with Dr. Gazante talking about the menorah of the Rambam and the menorah of Zaharia. And continuing from there, I will post the sign out in the chat. Um, but it is really my pleasure to introduce the speaker for tonight, Sophia Fornenstein, um, longtime friend and wonderful educator. Um, her formal bio reads as follows. Sophia Fornenstein is a second year student at Yeshiva Maharat and at Bernard Revel Graduate School where she's focusing on Jewish philosophy. She graduated with an honors bachelor degree in Jewish studies and philosophy from the University of Toronto and also completed her first basic unit of clinical pastoral education at Baycrest Geriatric Hospital at that time. Before university, Sophia competed in the International Chidan Tanakh and participated in the Jusha High School Program, the Bronfman Youth Fellowship, and the Tikva High School Program. She spent a gap year at Midrash at Lindsay Mam, has been co roach Beit Midrash at Camp Stone for two summers, and was the Director of Experiential Education at the Jusha High School Program this past summer. She is the Maharat intern for Anshay Shalom B'nai Israel in Chicago, as well as a Machon Siach graduate fellow. Um, tonight, she will be talking about Bereshi, sorry, Genesis 36, the significance of Asav's, Asav's family tree. Um, without further ado, Sophia, and I will post the sources in the chat so you guys will be free to follow along on those. Thank you so much, Atara. And it's so nice to be here and such an honor to be here. Um, I feel like I have somehow been a part of Torah Motion for a lot of my life as a Torontonian, as uh, hanging out with lots of Kelmans in my life. And it's very special to be here in this capacity today. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. The source sheet, I believe, will be posted in the chat. I have a PowerPoint for us to follow along on as well. Um, so I'm going to start with that here. Okay, perfect. And I can still see all your faces. Amazing. So this week's Parsha is Parsha by Yishlach. Lots of action happens in this week's Parsha. We have the famous struggle of Yaakov with the angel or the unknown figure uh, in the middle of the night. Yaakov gets renamed. We have the very troubling and intense story of Dina and what happens to her. And I actually want to talk about something that's not so dramatic or seemingly so at the beginning, which is chapter 36 of Breshit, of Genesis, which is all of um, Asaph's family tree. And I hope that by doing this tonight that we'll have a bit of a, sorry for the New York uh, sound, you can hear them. Um, I hope we'll have a better understanding of the chapter and hopefully see that's not really just about um, a family tree, there might be more going on. And before I wanna begin and dive right in, I wanna honor uh, this night's learning in honor of the yard site of my great grandmother who I'm named after, uh, which is tonight. She was a great enabler of uh, Torah learners in my family, and I think she would have been very happy to see what's happening here tonight. So let's get started. So the chapter is very long. If you have a Tanakh with you, I, I welcome you to pull it off the shelf and look at it. It's a lot of Sukim. What we're going to do here, and this is not on your source sheet yet because I just want to get a basic structure for what's going on, is going through some of the Sukim seeing chunks and themes. And then um, by the end of it, we'll have at least enough of a holding to feel like we understand the chapter enough to start having all the questions about it. And then we'll dive into some texts about the actual chapter. So these first psukim, I'm not gonna read them out loud, but they're here for you, um, are describing the generations of Esav, the Eilat Todot Esav who Edom. So this is a typical fashion for how um, lineage is portrayed and described within Breshit is talk about the Toledot, we're, we're used to this. We've seen this with um, all of, with Abraham, with Yitzchak so far, and now we're seeing it with Esav. And also a reminder here for us that he is also Edom. This is the, uh, the origin of the Edomites, and they come from Esav in particular. And then there's some lists of uh, different things going on there. We see that he's married uh, to some Canaanite women. Rivka, a few partiot ago, is very troubled by this, uh, concern of intermarriage for Kants. Um, which is pretty funny considering Judaism is not yet a religion, but she's unhappy with him marrying Canaanite women. Nevertheless, that's what he does. And 
uh, there's some of that here. The next chunk, um, starting at verse six, is describing what Asav does uh, with his family. We know from this week's Parsha that um, Yaakov and Asav finally confront each other after years of Yaakov running away from Asav. It's a little bit of a contentious um, getting uh, resolving of their relationship. And regardless of how one sees how they got together as being positive or negative, we know that they can't live together anymore. Similar to Avraham and Lot, um, all the way back in the church of Bayera, they're not able to live in the same place. It could be because there's strife, or it could also be because they're both shepherds and there's only so much uh, grass for their for their sheep to, sheep to be eating, and they can't share the same place. They need to go separate ways. So Asav and his family go to the hill country of Seir. And a nice another reminder again, Asav is Adom. The next chapter is uh, the next section is talking about Asav um, and um, the different people in his family. We have some more family tree lineage. An important detail that's going to come up um, in a lot of our text is the introduction of Timna. Um, this is in verse 12, that Timna was a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz, and she was the mother of Amalek, who we might recognize from future discussion in the Torah and even throughout Tanakh history, that Amalek is, becomes a true enemy of B'nai Israel. Um, and we have his origin story here. He comes from this concubine relationship. The next section talks about the Alufei ben Esav, the clans of the sons of Esav. Um, Esav is still, as much as he is not um, necessarily the, the patriarch that we look towards, that's Yaakov, he is still someone that gets the blessing that Abraham and Yitzchak got about having amazing generations with kings and with um, leaders of troops because he is still a part of the covenant in that way. And so it makes sense that we're going to read about the success of his family. Here's more of that. The next section is now different people um, also connected to Seir. Um, and then we have some interesting anecdotal details, I would say, about um, the people living there, similar to the family tree all the way at the beginning of Parsha Brishi, where we hear about the origin of certain musical instruments. It almost feels mythical and fantastical. We have an unusual story in uh, verse 24 that talks about um, Anna, who uh, finds um, finds the, it's a strange Hebrew term, it's the Hayemim, um, but the mules um, in the, in the or also the hot springs, depends on who you ask, in the wilderness. We're going to be talking about that too, and it's just interesting that we have that, that anecdote there in a bunch of names. Then we have a list of kings, very strange. Also, we just had all this family tree. Now we have kings that are in the area, in Eretz Edom. And it also explicitly says that these were kings um, that ruled before um, there were ever kings in Israel. We have that. And oh, and that's the end. That is the end of the chapter. So there's a lot of information there for us to be taking in. It's a lot of um, I would say somewhat dry um, information. It's not the same kind of fantastical stories that we see elsewhere. And it's great to have this context of Esau's family, but it does feel a little bit odd. We're reading all these amazing stories about the patriarchs in Breshi, and then all of a sudden we're given this list. And for me, I've always found that unusual. Breshi is supposed to be the, the safer, the book with the most stories. Um, and then this happens, and I found that to be an odd placing. And it looks like I'm not the only one um, with this strange feeling of why is this chapter here? Um, because we're going to be reading a story in the Gemara where someone asks just the same question and we're going to receive the result of that. And that's now where we get uh, to in our source sheet. And that's uh, source number one for us. So after understanding that summary of Genesis 36, we're now going to jump to Masechet Sanhedrin, a tractate that is filled with lots of um, lots of issues about how one should have Sanhedrin, a, a court of 70 men, um, or just how the regular Beiti and House of Judgment works. But the, a very interesting part of Sanhedrin is that the last chapter is dedicated to all of these uh, fantastic, interesting questions of heresy, because up until then, since we were discussing the courts, we were discussing capital punishment. And now the last chapter ends with, and here are the people that are not going to be able to get into the world to come. And the people who don't get into the world to them are people who believe certain things about the Torah, how it was given, things that are uh, incorrect about it. And it's these really unusual and fascinating stories. And there's one in particular about uh, Menashe. Menashe is the son of King Chizkiyahu, King Hezekiah, who was an amazing king. But Menashe himself 
goes off the derech, he does idol worship. And ultimately in the narrative within the book of Kings, at that moment, seeing Menashe doing all of the bad things is the tipping point for God to say, maybe it's time for there to not be a temple anymore for the Jews, uh, the Israelites to be exiled. So that's how bad he is. Um, and I think that what's happening here in the Gemara text is we're, we're trying to have a little bit of an origin story for why Menashe, whose father was so fantastic and amazing, could have ended up doing idol worship. And that is what we're going to be starting off with today in connection to our parrot. I'll read English for the, the sake of, of time here. Um, and let's begin. Menashe said, um, after starting to talk uh, words of Torah that are problematic, the term actually in the sugya beforehand is divrei dofi, um, that he was reading incorrect um, readings into the Torah. You might recognize the term dofi from our uh, Davani experience over the high holidays when we are clapping our chests and saying how we sin. One of them is Dibarnu Dofu. We spoke frivolously. We spoke without meaning. And so that is what Menashe is doing. He's interpreting the Torah in meaningless ways. So what did he say? But did Moshe need to write only insignificant matters that teach nothing? For example, and Lotan's sister was Timna, or and Timna was concubine to Elivaz, son of Esav, or Reuven went in the days of the wheat harvest and found Dudayim in the field. So Menashe has a similar question to that I had <laughs> when reading this parak, which is what exactly is its point? We, th it's this list, and I don't understand what it's coming to teach me. In addition, he mentions an interesting other pasuk as an example. Um, you might recognize that it's coming from a different chapter, from chapter 30. This was from last week's parasha, parasha Vayetze, where Ruvin takes Dudaim, which um, can be understood. There's many different sessions of what it could mean, but for here, I'll use the term mandrakes um, from the field. And, and that, now Menashe is saying, well, what exactly was the point of me knowing that detail? Seems pretty silly. If the Torah is supposed to be holy and full of interesting and important things, why is this what's in there? So what happens next? A divine voice, uh, a botko, emerged and said to him, you sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son, these things you have done, and should I have kept silence, that you would imagine that I was like you, that I will reprove you and set the matters before your eyes. So the botko actually quotes a pasuk from Tehillim. It's interesting that the botko is trying to justify to Menasha that the Torah is meaningful by quoting some, some more Tanakh. <laughs> but it seems here what the, what the botko is saying is it's, it's rude and inappropriate for you to be describing the Torah that is your heritage, your family in this way by suggesting that it's meaningless and also reprimanding him for doing such a thing. Ultimately, this is uh, what the Talmudic narrative sees as the beginning of Menashe's demise and what leads him to idol worship. He's so frustrated with the lack of meaning in these, uh, in these verses. And as much as the divine voice comes and reprimands him there, it doesn't work. And that's what leads him down his difficult path. So this is this is the the challenge I wanted to, to pose for us today that I'm hoping that this year is going to be addressing is this story is is really fun and interesting. For me, it's difficult because I think, well, how different are my concerns than Menashe's? I, too, have questions about what this parak, this chapter is all about. But I'm hoping that what we're going to be doing together is going through different potential answers to this question of what exactly is the meaning behind this parak that Menashe is missing on that the Baku will get so angry at him. And hopefully by doing that, um, some answers will be satisfying. I personally think some of them will not be. Hopefully by going through different understandings that are literary, that are historical, that are mystical, we'll see different ways to reckon with what this parak is all about. And maybe by the end of it, we'll come to some kind of solution or, or possibility for meaning in the text that we have. So the first answer that I wanna provide are some technical solutions, right? It seems that Menashe is frustrated by there not being meaning in this list. And so the first approach we're going to have here is actually, let's, let's try and find some, some meaning that you're missing. There might be something useful here, not necessarily emotionally resonant, but, but significant in the sense that it might help us out. Uh, it might teach us a lesson. So that's the first answer that we're going to look at. Uh, what I love about Gemara sometimes is that there might be some pretty significant statements it seems to suggest, oh, you really cannot explore the following. And then in a Gemara rhetoric kind of fashion, say, wait a minute, what exactly are you supposed to not be exploring? And then they go and explore it. Uh, it's not the first time that the Gemara would be doing something like this, but that's actually what the rest of the Sogya in Sanhedrin does, which is 
gets mad at Menasha for not being able to see the meaning in that parak, and then it goes, wait a minute, but what what is meaningful about that parak? And that is the first uh, answer we're going to be looking at today. So a continuation of Sanhedrin. Um, we're going to be looking at, and you might remember when we were uh, reviewing the chapter at the beginning, I, I pointed out some specific interesting details that come up. So the answer that they're going to be focusing on here is specifically focusing on Timna, um, the character of Timna. She was the one who was Elifaz, the son of uh, Esau's concubine, who then was the mother of Amalek. And we're going to be seeing uh, how they deal with finding meaning in that. So we'll continue again in English just for the sake of time and uh, getting through as much material. Timna sought to convert. So not clear in the text whatsoever. Also, we're talking about a world in which the Torah has not yet been given. What does it actually mean to convert? But um, that's what the Gemara is saying, is that the text is meaningful because it's telling us the story about Timna. She sought to convert. She came before Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and they did not accept her. She went and became a concubine of Eliphaz, son of Esav, and said, referring to herself, it is preferable that she will be a maidservant for this nation, and she will not be a noblewoman for another nation. So uh, Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, almost like a, like a base dean of, of today, <laughs> she approaches them and says, please let me come join you. And they did not accept her, which is very difficult to hear. Then um, she said, I, instead, I'm going to become a concubine for Eliphaz. I know he's somewhat related to the family uh, because he is uh, Asaph's son. And she says, ultimately, it will be better for me to be a maid servant in this nation than not be a noble woman elsewhere. If you read the, the text in depth in uh, chapter 36, it says that Timna comes from uh, a, royal, a royal group. And so it shows that she is downsizing herself by becoming a concubine, but she's saying it's just so amazing to be somehow part of the future of the Jewish people that I'd rather be that and demote myself um, than stay elsewhere. And what happens next? Ultimately, Amalek, son of Elibaz, emerged from her, and that tribe afflicted the Jewish people. What is the reason the Jewish people were punished by suffering at the hand of Amalek? It is due to the fact that they should not have rejected her when she sought to convert. Therefore, the verse is significant. So what happens is in a midah, keneged midah, a, a tit for tat, a midrashic tit for tat kind of fashion, um, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov do not treat Timna properly. And then the result is that she has Amalek who becomes the enemy of the Israelite people and seeks to destroy them throughout history. So it seems that because we did not treat her kindly when she sought to convert at the beginning, therefore we as a Jewish people have to suffer for generations for it. So... Um, it's a very interesting passage. There's a lot that one could talk about, about you know, modern contemporary politics of how do we treat converts? And you know, she wanted to be welcomed. What does it mean for us to be doing that in the community in a, in a practical sense? But I think that it's a really powerful story, regardless of, of the politics, the idea that we were supposed to be welcoming and we were not, and therefore we are punished. As much as it might be difficult also to think, why, why would it be fair that the generations have to suffer for Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov's mistakes? I think that the, the message about being kind to, to converts and being kind to people who are outside of our community and welcoming them in is, is fantastic. Um, and here we're ultimately answering Menasha's question. Menasha, you thought that this pasuk meant nothing. And then you actually missed this entire world unto and of itself about the importance of inclusion. You missed that in that pasuk. So this is showing us, oh, Menasha, you got it wrong. This is a technical answer to your problem. This is something that was meaningful. A funny other approach um, that is the continuation of that sugya is then talking about the other verse that Menashe is troubled by, which was about Ruvain and the Dudaim, the Mandrakes. Um, I don't want to get too sidetracked on this one because it does take away from our chapter, but I do think it's interesting and like really problematizes Menashe's approach, which is that um, what they what Chazal are teaching here, um, I'll just summarize it outside just for the sake of time, is that um, Ruvain takes these durim during the time of the wheat harvest. And this is supposed to teach us that he could have taken grain, but he took these uh, mandrakes, right? It, because it was the harvest season, it wouldn't have looked so obvious just to take grain. And he didn't. And so this is showing us that he didn't steal. And we now learn that righteous people don't steal. Okay, thank you. That, personally, I don't find that so satisfying. But what I think is, is actually more significant here is um, if we know the context of that pasuk, if you might recall from last week's Parsha, Reuven is bringing those mandrakes and he's bringing them in the hopes that um, it will help his mother, Leah, be the chosen wife of the evening for Yaakov instead of Rachel. It's a part of this larger fight between Leah and Rachel and who's going to, to win out um, in light of childbearing and being Yaakov's favorite. 
And so for me, then, when we think about that pasuk in particular, that um, that Menashe doesn't see significance in that is quite odd, right? It's not just like a random grocery list of, oh, here's some random fruits and vegetables that might interest you. No, it's, it's actually an integral prop in the story. Um, because also it's important to understand here, and there's a lot of commentary about this, is that the mandrakes also might be an aphrodisiac. That might be like a totally different addition to the story about giving Leia the upper hand um, in, in that fight. So I think that regardless of, I, I find this discussion like a little bit um, not, not so satisfying for me. Um, I was going to say silly, but they are still, you know, words of Chazal. But I do find this not a particularly helpful answer. But the idea of Menasha questioning the, the mandrakes seems extra absurd to me. Okay, the list of the family tree, I understand. I don't fully understand why that's important either. But that, that feels like an integral part of the story. So that gives me more hope that there really has to be something um, in the story, uh, in, the, in the lineage of Asab that we could be finding. One more technical answer before we finish the technical solutions approach um, that is recorded in more of the theme in the Guide of the Flex for the Rambam is a reminder that this is actually like a helpful halachic point. Um, he mentions that we have a real halachic imperative to blot out Amalek's name. Of course, there's been lots of discussion throughout the centuries of what that entails, who even is Amalek anymore, how does that match with our moral values? I'm sure, you know, we'll, maybe Parsha Bashalaf, someone will talk about the, the moral implications of that in their Parsha Shir, but not for us tonight. But it's important to know who is Amalek and who is not. In fact, we have a mitzvah to be kind to the Edomites. Um, and so it's important for us to know the difference between who's Amalek and who's Edom. So it's great to have a family tree so that we don't get anyone confused. That's what the Rambam says here in um, the Guide for the Perplexed. Uh, this is within the Rambam's attempt to try and find rationale in the Torah. It's very important for him that the Torah does not seem to be irrational. That was very important to him philosophically. And so he's saying, okay, this seems like a, an insignificant list. Not true. It's very significant. It helps us technically uh, figure out who should be killed and who should not be killed. So thank you, Rambam. I appreciate that. Not as much my, my lived everyday experience of figuring out who I should be killing and who not. But at least it provides a technical solution of saying, Menasha, it was in, it was unfair for you to question the significance of these two teams. They're coming to serve a technical purpose. Those are the technical approaches. Now I want to look at a different kind of approach. Um, this is called the historical approach. So what's very interesting about this, this whole parent, this chapter, is that it gives us insight into the nature of how Edom worked, right? We have the family tree. We also have these kings. Um, and that, that's interesting and cool for the historians in the room. If you, if you find, you know, in archaeology, some kind of family tree or even just a list, it's just so exciting. It gives you a window into what the world was like at that time. And I think that there is potential for that to be this. And I think even for the, the not historians in the room, if that seems a little bit dry, even within the Tanakh itself, we do have examples of that. In Divra Hamim, in the Book of Chronicles, it, it's literally a Book of Chronicles. It's multiple family trees multiple kings. There's a lot of repetition of it also in the Book of Kings. Um, I wanted to provide, I thought this was a very funny and interesting even Ezra um, on our on our Parsha that uh, addresses the Divrahamim connection a bit. Um, and also I think maybe the potential problem with talking about history. So I'm going to read it here for us. So this is specifically on the section of that chapter that is about kings. Yesh omrim ki bederech some people say that this was written as a kind of prophecy. Um, the reason why I think that they're going to be saying that is that some of the people that are mentioned in, um, in the, in the parak, it could be understood that they're actually similar names to people who come up later in Jewish history. So saying it's a kind of prophecy solves that problem. Oh, it's not an issue of, of historicity. It said it was a kind of nivua. But here comes the following fascinating tidbit. But this guy, Yitzchaki, um, he says in his book that actually this chapter was not written by Moshe Rabbeinu on Mamar Har Sinai. It was written during the time of King Yehoshaphat hundreds of years later. Um, and that's why the names sound like something from later on in Jewish history. It was actually written at a different time. And then even Ezra, even Ezra, I think it's very typical of even Ezra to be like quite mean and funny <laughs> um, about his interlocutors that he disagrees with. And he says, and that's why he was called Yitzchaki, because everyone used to laugh at him <laughs> because that was such a preposterous suggestion. 
Um, and what was the exact suggestion? Ki amar, ki hadad hu hadad ha'edomi, ve'amar ki mehetavel achot tach pin chaim. Um, these are different characters that come up in later Jewish history. He's trying to show that actually the characters from here match the ones from there. Seems to be that maybe this chapter is almost in the wrong place, almost put there out of order. Um, the Khalila Khalila, heaven forbid, far be it for me, for one. No way that you could ever say that this is actually written during the time of Yehoshaphat, just as Yitzhaki says, anyone who sees this book should burn it. <laughs> so that, that was also a different world of, of book burning, I guess. And um, this is the Ibn Ezra trying to attack him for these very radical and heretical ideas. But what I think is here is, yes, the beauty of history, but also the, the Torah is not necessarily a history book, right? The Torah is also coming to show us morals and stories and tell us our, our story as a nation. But this is a bit weird. <laughs> and I think that this is what this, uh, this Ibn Ezra is showing us is that having a random list does still feel quite, quite odd amongst, uh, amongst the rest of the stories. So much so that there's this controversy with Yitzhaki. I thought it was quite funny. Um, but I do think that it is showing the potential answer of history to some of these things, um, saying this is just a helpful history tidbit that we're learning all about Asaph's family and all about the kings, but also that if we're really seeing Torah this way, there are a lot of problems that that can come up, and then we have to start thinking, well, if it's really a historical record, what happens when other places match? Not so, not necessarily the direction we want to go. The next source I have here is is just a little bit more um, about the about the structure. Um, Nachum Sarna, who wrote the commentary for uh, the JPS. Um, for Genesis, just as discussing the nature of, of the structure being quite weird, um, especially with the kings, it says that they reigned and then they died in, in Debrei HaMim, there's usually more story in between. It says for the first seven, they reigned and then they died, they reigned and then they died, and the last one had a wife. So he's just like struggling with the structure there. But what he's uh, talking about also is that it's very similar to an ancient Near Eastern context of how we talk about kings. There are non-Jewish sources that talk about kings this way. Um, and he notes that this is definitely unique in the Hebrew Bible, and maybe it's still showing us some kind of window to how history was perceived um, at that time, and maybe that's what's coming to help us. So that's the historical approach um, to Menashe's answer, that it, these are significant because that's how history works, and it's important for us to understand ourselves in the, in the chain of history and helpful to, for us to understand our ancestors better, and that's, that's a good enough answer for why this parak is important. Um, I'm going to go through one more approach. This is a literary approach. And then hopefully we can take some questions because I, I, we're definitely going through a lot of information and I want to make sure everyone is on the same page as we continue. But uh, let's look at um, another approach before we get to that. So this is a more literary approach. This is thinking about Rashid as a book and thinking about the usage of juxtaposition, right? Like when we're thinking about when we read novels, when we see one incident and then another and seeing the similarities and the differences are coming to teach us something about the two characters. We have our story of Esau in chapter 36, but next, the, the Parsha after by Yishach in chapter 37 starts off with a very similar narrative about Yaakov and his Toledot, his generations. And it's supposed to be seen as an opportunity of we have Yitzchak here, I'm sorry, Esau here, and now it's time for us to see how Esau's story is going to be different than Yaakov's. And that makes sense. And we're interested in that because we come from Yaakov and, and not Asav, and they're very different. And that teaches us a lot about their, their character in Rashi. So the Rashi here um, I, is, is a very interesting Rashi. I'll summarize it here because I think actually Aviva Zornberg, who is our source next, explains the Rashi much more eloquent, not more eloquent than Rashi himself per se, but it's helpful for us in, in our endeavor. Um, so I think that's more worthwhile for us to be reading that. But basically what Rashi is saying in the beginning of next week's Parsha is uh, noticing that, th that it comes after the Ace, of story, uh, the Ace of chapter. For me, I always feel like it's very long because it is a whole chapter long. But then when you think about it, the generations of Yaakov are the rest of the Torah. <laughs> so when you think about it in that grand scheme of things, it's actually not that long. And that's what we're reminded here. Um, and uh, the reason why is he says, They were not distinguished or important enough to be given a lot of airtime, right? Like, Esau is not as important in our story. And there's a, a mashal at the bottom. Uh, um, we can compare this to an analogy of a pearl falling in the sand. Adam 
מי שמצאה הוא משליך את שרורות מידו ונוטה למרגלית. I don't really know how pearls work, but it seems that, oh, the way that you find pearls is you dig through the sand, you find the pearl, and sometimes you have to dig through a lot of gross stuff, some, some rocks, some debris to get to what you really would like. And so that's how you view <laughs> chapter 36. You got to dig through some of the gross stuff in order to get to the good stuff, the Yaakov. And that's what Aviva Zornberg is going to be saying for us here. For those of you who are not familiar with Aviva Zornberg, she is a contemporary. She it, writes amazing books um, of commentary on the Torah that weave both traditional understandings of Torah and modern psychology and modern philosophy and modern literary theory in a really amazing way. And it's very, I would say accessible because it's in English, but it's actually not so accessible because she is very wordy, I would say. She, she's very intelligent. She knows how to bring in all these sources, but it almost feels like you need a commentary for Aviva Zornberg herself. But I think that she explains uh, the significance of this Rashi um, quite helpful for us. And so she says, Rashi contrasts the account of Esau's Toledot, his children and descendants, with that of Jacob's Toledot. The main difference between the two accounts of set settlings and offspring is a matter of length. Esau's children produce children no more time than it takes to read the words on the page. Esau himself settles in the, city, in the hill country of Seir with equal uncomplicated promptitude. The narrator is simply not interested enough to give us the complexities of a story of settling and childbearings. When it comes to Jacob and his Toledot, his Yeshuvim, however, the story is told in all its complication, in all the terrible heart-stopping details. The turnings of the Wheel of Fortune, the wrenching reversals of the plot, which retroactively can be seen to create a chain of causality, all of this is given in full circumstantial detail in Jacob's case. The, the difference between the two narratives, however, is clearly more than just a matter of length. The real issue is one of importance. Asa's family is not literally worth thinking about, Chashuvim, taking the, the term from Rashi. Their lives resolve themselves in predict uh, predictably and simply. There are no secret areas, Funim, no crevices out of which God can speak. They settle down in their own country. They bear children. They even produce kings, exemplars of national coherence, many generations before Yaakov's children are ready to do so. And now I'll move this of oh, good. I can see the rest. Jacob's settling is a long story. It's also a story of contingency and cruelty that tears apart the elegant closure that Yaakov speculated he could read into his own lifetime. But for this very reason, paradoxically, Jacob and his children are called Sifunim v'chashuvim. They are substantial, complicated, with secret potentialities, which can take time to explore. So, um, wordy, but interesting and, and thoughtful, I would say. She's noticing the, the issue of length that, it, that as much as I thought chapter 36 was long in the grand scheme of things, it's short. You read it and you've got all the information that you need. While for the stories of, of Yaakov and his children, they're more complicated, more dramatic. And that actually shows us that they're more significant. I think this is also a, a beautiful uh, detail about life, I guess, right? Like you could have the simple black and white back and forth of how it should be. But actually, the more meaningful life here seems to be one that might have more pain, but involves this more nuance, more sense of complicatedness, and actually sees that as the opportunity for godliness to come in. So I think this is a very interesting um, approach to how are we going to answer Menashe about the significance of, of this parak. It almost is conceding and saying, yes, Menashe, this parak is insignificant, but actually intentionally so in a, in a strange way. That yes, this parak is supposed to be boring because you need to be thinking about chapter 37 and what comes after that. And this actually is still coming to teach us something significant about, um, about Yaakov uh, in particular. But of course, there, there are difficult parts about this because, I don't know, there's a sense of, of like real elitism superiority to the Rashi, like, oh, like everything else is debris and we're the pearl. Um, but I think that the way that Aviva Zorberg talks about it in this literary way is, is a quite, I can see the image of the pearl in a much more meaningful way when, when she speaks. And I also think that her message about what life, meaningful life can be like is, is very powerful. So um, before we move on to our next category, um, I, I'm, we're going to have questions at the time at the end, but I also feel like if people don't understand earlier on, it's always helpful to clarify uh, before then. So I'm just going to take a look at, um, at the chat. But if you have any questions, Atara, I don't know what the, the protocol is. Do people raise their hands? Is that how this works? Um, you could start by going through the ones in the chat, and then after that, if people want to unmute, they are, they are welcome to. Fantastic. Oh, okay. you're ready to go on, and then you just let us know. Um, okay, why do they say that Asaph is a shepherd all the way at the beginning? We'll see some more things about shepherding um, come up, actually, in the final approaches. 
Um, I think it's a good question. I mean, I think it goes back to what we were saying before about Yaakov and Esav not being able to live together, right? That part of it is also like a real pragmatic issue is that they both have the same profession and therefore the same resources. So I'm thinking that could be a, a helpful detail, but it is a way that he we're was, not just, I always so. thought of Esav as a hunter. That's, That's why I said right. that. Right, I think that is interesting, right? Like the whole point at the beginning of, of Toldot is trying to show how Yaakov and Esav are not similar. And that, like that's, the shepherd seems much more tame and then Esav is the hunter. So yeah, I think I think that is an interesting point. It shows, I guess, that we can have multiple personalities um, or multiple facets of our personalities, um, which I think is, is great. But I do think that's a, a helpful detail. Um, okay. Is it not a great honor to have a divine voice answer or respond to one's questions, challenges in any way? Great Great point. Maybe this is the interesting part about this agada is that as much as Menashe's uh, question is almost heretical the way they're asking it, like by having a divine voice respond shows that there's something there. And I mean, that's where I'm coming from in this year is that there is something there. Um, it's more about the approach and in, in trying to find the good and trying to find an answer altogether. So I think that that is a great, a great read. Um, why does the Torah mention so many women associated with Asaph by name? Yet other very righteous women, like the mother of Samson, are not uh, named in the Torah. Great question. <laughs> we'll have some discussion also about the names of women coming up. It'll be a little bit upsetting if you were, <laughs> if you were looking for some nice redeeming way of thinking about Torah talking about women, but uh, maybe it'll come to, to solve that, that problem. Um, yes, I think that this point about, um, about the converts that um, was mentioned here, that in the Midrash, it says that um, actually the Avraham was very good at taking converts is a good point. There are many Midrashim that say many things. So there we go. Um, and um, yes, um, well, I think I think that this point about the Todot of Esau being genealogical and the Todot of Jacob being the narratives is actually a Vivas Lundberg's point that like that that Asaph's family does not deserve the airtime of the narrative. He's not as significant, but but Yaakov's does. We we get the whole TV show, so I think that uh, that is there. But that is a good point. Uh, okay, we're gonna move on now that we've continued, um, and then of course we'll have more time um, at the end. Okay, so that was a literary approach. I have I would say two more other reasons that are coming in with like whole new kinds of texts entirely. And then the last answer I think we're gonna have is more meta points. So just you have a little bit of a, of a roadmap for where we're going. Okay. So this one, this is gonna get a little bit crazy. We're gonna talk about some mystical underpinnings of this chapter. I will say that I first started being interested in this chapter all the way back in my Kabbalah class in second year university, when we were reading Gershom Sholem's major trends of Jewish mysticism, and this chapter gets mentioned as being the core text for all of Lurianic Kabbalah. <laughs> I went, well, that's odd. I don't understand why. I thought we just said, we just saw it was a bunch of names. So we're going to be exploring that a bit. Um, that actually was the impetus of this entire share for me of like, what exactly was going on when Gershom Sholem said that? Um, so I, I'm very excited about this part. It might be a little bit more um, out of people's comfort zones, I understand. Um, because mystical texts are quite odd. Um, but I, I think there's some interesting stuff here. So, so um, hang on for the ride. <laughs> okay, so this text is from Rabbeinu Bachia. Rabbeinu Bachia is a 13th, 14th century Spanish uh, commentator, and he is very mystically inclined. Um, and the way that he explains this chapter is the following. Valder um, This is the Kabbalistic perspective. Quoting the Pasuk, these are the kings who reigned over the land of Edom. Okay, so this is indicating that there, there were kings that ruled in the land of Edom. This is referencing the world that God initially created and this idea of God created a lot of worlds and destroyed them before he got to ours. God created the world, these worlds, the Midat Hadin, an attribute of judgment. There's an idea in uh, Kabbalah, but also within the, the Gemara as well. Um, it comes up a lot in, during the high holidays. There's, you know, Midat Hadin and Midat Arachamim, that there's the attribute of, of harsh judgment, more black and white, more punitive. And then there's the attribute of compassion, 
um, and they're supposed to be seen as opposing, but yet God is, does both. Um, and so the idea is that these first worlds were created, the Midat Hadin, in this harsh sense of judgment, before this world was created, because this world was created, the Midat Hadin, that this world is a more compassionate one. Um, and that is what is being referenced when it says in the Pasuk, Zehu Lifnei Malach Malach Lifnei Yisrael. An unusual anecdote that's in that Pasuk that they're picking up on is that it says, these are the kings of Edom, and there were kings in Edom before there were ever kings in Israel. Okay, that's, that's a strange phrase to say in the Torah. And so they're saying it's because it has this deeper Kabbalistic significance that these were the worlds that were destroyed and, and not like this one. This is the Olam Shel Yisrael. This is the ideal world. And that's what was happening here. So explaining the, the worlds were destroyed, created, destroyed, created, destroyed until we got to this one. Lahavdi, lahavdi. I guess it's like making some kind of art project where you know you don't start off well. You got to start back, start fresh. Um, and uh, at the end, Rabbi Bachi says, and I actually can't tell you more about this because these words are are deep, elevated, and concealed, and actually, like this this sense of of mystical significance and secretiveness is actually what holds the whole world together. <laughs> Pretty intense. Um, this is a source from the Zohar, which uh, attributed to uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, um, but now often understood as being written by Moshe de Leon, um, which describes a lot of this uh, also around uh, a little bit earlier than Rabbi Nubachia. But this idea of the analogy that uh, Israel is the kernel of the world, and then these other destroyed worlds were like shells that had to be broken through to get to the kernel, um, an unusual image. Uh, but imagery that's often uh, quite common in uh, mystical understandings, where there's breaking of certain things and then putting back together, ultimately to get to a, a perfect model. And that these that this uh, chapter is showing those broken models before we got to, to Israel. I will say, if this does feel a little convoluted, um, Stein, um, Rich Steinzaltz, uh, Rabbi Dean Steinzaltz, who uh, passed away a few years ago, in his commentary to the Torah, I think says it, quite eloquently about what the significance of this mystical understanding is. Um, I have it here open with me. He says, um, this alludes to heavenly forces that existed before the world as we know it came to being. The rise of the monarchy in Edom before there was an Israeli king reflects the depths of the relationships between the twin brothers, Esav and Yaakov. In many aspects, Esav is the shadow of Yaakov. So what he seems to be portraying here is that uh, we're seeing a world in this chapter of a world that could have been um, almost like a, a, an evil um, villain kind of, you know, um, other opportunity if, if, if the world had turned out differently. This is what it could have been like, where actually now Esav is the one that was chosen and not Yaakov. And ultimately, Yaakov is chosen. And so seeing a, a peeking into this world is supposed to make us feel more appreciative for our own. Um, and I think if, if using Yaakov and Esav and this idea of the shadow feels difficult, I think seeing it um, from a moralistic sense that originally one would assume that the world should have been created the Midat Hadin, that should be a world of harsh judgment. But actually we had to get to Midat Harachamim to a world of compassion, um, I think is, is a very beautiful message that is deep within the Kabbalistic analogies. But this idea that actually the most ideal world is not one of harsh judgment, um, that it is one of compassion. And that's actually the world that we are, that we are living in, that we got to, and that God idealizes, um, idealizes. So I think that um, that that is is a helpful way to to glean the good uh, from from this Kabbalistic understanding. I also want to note that um, this idea that the worlds were created, destroyed, created, and destroyed until we got to this one is Kabbalah, but is also in the Midrash um, and in Breshi Rabbah. Here, there is the same idea that God created, destroyed, created, destroyed until He found the world that was most ideal for Him, um, and so it doesn't have to feel so out of whack, so spiritual, like it is an understanding in our text. But to go all the way back to Menashe and to say, well, what was the significance of this parak? Of what was the whole significance of this family tree? Imagine we said to Menashe, Menashe, the reason why this, is, this chapter was so important is that this could have been the world that, that could have been where everything went wrong, where everything went upside down, and you're just treating it as if it's nothing. So a, a fascinating approach to, to this parak. That's how I heard about it for the first time. I think it's a, a great reminder of when something can feel quite dry, who knows <laughs> what else is out there about it. This feels like the, the total opposite of that approach and I find it quite cool.
the next approach that we have here is the polemical approach. Um, this approach is actually inspired by uh, an essay read by Professor Rabbi Marty Luxon, who I believe is, is a, quite the regular here on Torah and Motion, also from Toronto originally, where he writes an amazing essay called Shot or Polemics, The Case for Genesis 36. He is a Rashbam expert, a commentator expert, and he talks about how often commentators are aware of of the non-Jewish groups that are surrounding them, how that might affect the kind of parshanut, the kind of commentary that they come up with. Um, so it's thanks to him that I um, found um, this understanding of uh, maybe what this chapter is all about. I think it's very fascinating. So this is from Masechet Psachim, not uh, commentary. This is this is Talmud, but um, still the Talmud was written in the time of Roman rule, and Rome was seen as the future of what Edom um, of what Edom slash Esav um, came from. So that'll be significant here. There's a list of Masach Psachim that maybe some of you are familiar with. It's an amazing list of things that were created on the first days of creation. Um, and they're all quite fantastical. There's something very special about those first six days. So an example would be um, Bilam's donkey was created on that day. A really funny one is that the first pair of tongs were created that day because there's like almost like a, a scientific or even philosophical problem of first mover where like the first set of tongs need to have been created I guess by God because in order to make tongs you need tongs <laughs> so it seems that was very that was very troubling for Chazal and they need to think oh somewhere someone had to have created tongs so God created tongs on the first six day it's this great list and then there's a list of what happened on Motzei Shabbat and it says over Motzei Shabbat so you might recognize the story. It's the origin story of Havdalah. It's the first real day for Adam Harishon because it's day seven and he was created on day six and the sun starts setting. And he says, oh my gosh, the world is ending <laughs> because he doesn't realize that this is just how it works, right? That there's a cycle and that the sun will rise again. And God gives him the ability to create fire. And that's the or origin story of Havdalah. It's also great in a totally different note to compare it to the, the Greek myth of Prometheus in which uh, Prometheus has to fight the gods to get fire. While in our story, God gives us the resources to be self-sufficient with fire. So that, that's interesting in its own right. There's been some interesting literature about that. But the idea is that Motzei Shabbat, God created the ability for um, Adam to make fire. Now, what else does Adam Arishon do? Interesting that this is his first activity after he created fire. He takes two animals. He takes a horse and a donkey and mates them together to create a mule. <laughs> Interesting that that's what he does. But we have a contradictory opinion. But Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says, no, 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 I have a contradictory origin story for where mules came from. It comes from our parak, from our chapter. And we even alluded to it in our initial summary of what this chapter is supposed to be. There's someone named Anan. He finds these hayemim, unclear what that means. There's an understanding it could be like a spring, but also this idea that maybe it could mean a mule um, in the desert. Okay, interesting tangent. <laughs> the next part of, um, of the Gemara. So why exactly are we so curious about um, attaching Ana to the creation of a mule? Where could that be coming from? And this is what, um, this is what it says. It says that um, Ana was a product of an incestuous relationship. It's a, a, a relationship that Whitney can pursue or invalid, as in it would be difficult for him to, uh, it would not halakhi be possible for him to get married and coming from an inappropriate relationship, incest. Therefore, he created something else that was unfit to reproduce, i.e. create a hybrid between, to breed a, a donkey and a horse and create a mule. And so the way that they see this is they see the psukim that we have about the family tree None of us really paid attention to it because we thought it was quite boring. But if you see, there's some names that get repeated and it's not merely a scribal error or I don't know, when I'm making lists, I often repeat things. This is the Torah. We have to see that every single verse and term is significant and not a waste. And therefore, if things are repeated, it's actually coming to tell us something. And when you look carefully 
in the same list, it says here, one verse describes both Anan and Sivon as sons of Seir, meaning that they are brothers, while the other verse describes Anan and Sivon's son, it teaches there is an incestuous act that had happened. Um, and so from there, um, it seems that it's almost, again, a tit for tat, a midah, keneged midah, because Anna was the product of this incestuous relationship, so too he would create something that is, is not breathable with the rest of the world. So obviously difficult, right? Like this is, this is a very painful relationship, reflects a, a deep halachic difficulty, moral difficulty. Why is the child of such a relationship the one that gets, the, the, gets in trouble also? Um, it's, it's quite graphic. It's, it's odd, but it seems, um, and this is what Professor Lakshan talks about, about the nature of what, um, of what, where polemics could come in, is that wouldn't it be helpful if Rome, um, who is deeply affecting Chazal at the time, right, they're being persecuted for learning Torah, wouldn't it be useful to understand their origin story and to see, um, to see them as coming from something that is so deeply problematic? I think that that, that, is, that is where Professor Lakshan is going with that article. Um, I'm the one who's extending it to Talmud, but I do see it as there. And I think not that it could justify, you know, these difficult stories, but if we're also thinking about Chazal struggling with that um, and thinking, you know, why, why, is, why is Rome doing something that's so difficult and painful to me? And to say, well, also they have this pain in their past and that's why they might be acting this way. Um, it could be helpful for them. And so I think that that is the, the point of, of what this story is here and seeing that that um, there are real terms to, to reckon with um, that are similar in, in the parak uh, names, but also that this teaches us something about the nature of what Rome is like. Um, Midrash Tankuma is basically the same thing. It's, it's stressing it um, once again. Actually, the reason why we have that chapter is explicitly to show their degeneracy, to show the incest that happens there, which then allows us to put a moral judgment on them. So again, if we're going all the way back to our initial response to Menashe, Menashe, why do you think this, this parak is significant? It is significant because you learn a lot about Rome and about Esau um, from hearing about this story. So now I wanna go to our last approach. This personally is my favorite approach. And I think that also it is um, a microcosm of what exactly has been happening this, this whole past, how long? 53 minutes we've been together. I think what is so amazing about the Jewish tradition in particular is this opportunity to be exegetical, to be interpretive about absolutely everything, and to, to see that as welcoming. And I think that this pair provides a, a really great challenge for that, right? What is the significance of this chapter? And yet by seeing Torah in the way that we do, there has to be an answer. We have to see upon ourselves an imperative as being connected to the text that we need to find out what that is. Um, and so I'm hopefully going to show you now some texts that kind of deal with that and the significance of, of all of Torah, of every single verse, um, and our charge um, as, as Jews of the Torah and the Jews of this story um, for how to interpret it. This is the Rambam again in Mor Nebuchim in the Guide of the Perplexed, um, also in the same section. Um, he's dealing with, again, how do we answer the question of, well, some verses in the Torah feel like they're insignificant and Rambam cares about rationalism, things making sense. So we need to struggle with that. What does he say? Every narrative in the law serves a certain purpose in connection with religious teaching. It either helps to establish a principle of faith or to regulate our actions and to prevent wrong and injustice among men. And I will show this in each case. So he goes through all the difficult um, to find meaning sections and ours is one of them as we saw, but it seems integral for the Rambam that of course, every, not just Halakha, but every narrative, every story in uh, the Torah has to, has to be, have a reason. That is significant. Um, it has to come to teach us something, whether it be to help us fix our faith, or could help, you know, teach us something about our actions or teach us about justice, which I think we've, we've seen so far, right? Like with the Timna story and the converts, that, that story feels like it's not in the shot in the literal meaning of the text, but it's also teaching us about the nature of how to relate to those outside of our community. The story about the incest, obviously deeply problematic, but also now is, is helping us think about the injustices that occurred to Chazal when they were under Roman rule. So we can see this text as an opportunity, even in, in the strange answers, I would say. I, I didn't find all of the answers so far particularly satisfying. I feel like they always added something, but I don't know if it was enough to like uh, scratch the itch of what is the significance of this, of this chapter. Uh, but all of these answers are attempting to, to figure out uh, these issues. 
Um, this source is from the Rambam as well in his Haktama de Perak the, the introduction to Perak Chelek, which was that chapter of Sanhedrin that we started with. Within it are the principles of the Ikare Amuna, the principles of, of faith, uh, 13 principles of faith that you might be familiar with, that you might have heard of before. A whole separate shiur, I'm sure that's even been given in Torah emotions that the nature of what are those 13 principles? Are we a religion that has dogma where we believe that there's creed that we need to believe certain things? But uh, regardless, it's a very helpful tool to see what are the important tenets of faith um, for the halakhically oriented. And um, that that is still uh, significant and helpful regardless. So the Rambam's eighth principle is uh, the idea that Torah mina shemaim. Torah Torah mina shemaim, that the Torah is um, is from heaven. Okay, all of it has to have been given from Moshe and come from God. So it came from God, it came from being spoken. Um, Moshe was a scribe. He was writing all these things. Didn't come from him himself. Okay. Okay. Great. Some, some more details. This is why he's called the engraver. And here's the part that's significant. And now it's about the nature of what Torah is because it all comes from God. So because we have this premise of God is uh, behind every single pasuk, every pasuk is significant. There is no difference between these technical lists. This list actually of, um, about B'nai Cham is from um, Parsha Noah in the um, different genealogy there. Um, but then we also have um, Sukim for us, right? Timna comes back again. There's no difference between those Sukim and the Pasuk, I am Hashem, your God, and even Shema Yisrael, right? This is like the declaration of Jewish faith. And we are told here that an integral part of believing that the Torah is completely holy is that actually there's no difference between those Sukim. These are all from the same God and um, both all pure, holy, and true. So this becomes, this, this chapter becomes a microcosm for, for belief that even in the seemingly least significant, God is still there. Not only is God there, but God is there as much as God is in all the, the very powerful psukim. A really great way to, to say it, I thought the Zohar said in, in, a, in a particularly edgier way, um, but I think that it's, that it's a fun way to say it. Um, it says, it says Rabbi Shimon, woe to the man who says that the Torah came to merely relate stories in ordinary words. For if this was so, even in this present day, we can make a Torah from ordinary tales. And one's probably nicer than those. That's the part where I, that's pretty shocking for the Zohar to say. If it came to prevent earthly matters, then even the present rulers of the world have among themselves works which are superior. Again, pretty shocking the Zohar says that. If this is the case, let us follow their example and compose some sort of Torah on our own. Rather, the Torah contains in all its words supernal truths and sublime mysteries. The stories of the Torah are thus only her outer garments, and whoever looks upon that garment as being the Torah itself, woe to that man, such a one will have no portion in the next world. So the Zohar is saying, okay, th there's technical details. If it was purely about literature, maybe there's greater literature elsewhere, but no, that's not what the Torah is because the Torah is holy, and if you think that there's no meaning there, you're not digging hard enough. So I, I thought it was a very powerful way to say it. But the last source I'll leave us with um, this evening is one that might be familiar with, that might be familiar with already, um, but I think is, is how I feel about this whole narrative um, and the significance of this narrative is the very first Rashi on the Torah. Um, Rashi asks, why, why didn't we start with Halakha, right? Why didn't we start all the way um, with the first mitzvah, all the way in Parsha Shmot? Uh, sorry, in Parsha Bo, in Sefer Shmot. Why, why not start there? But there's something... Um, there's something else going on. Of course, the answer that Rashi gives is a very technical answer um, that has to do with like knowing that the land is given to us by God. But I think the question is key here, which is that why don't we just have a Torah full of halachot? But no, the idea is that there's actually something helpful and meaningful in narrative. Um, and this is similar to what the, the Zohar and the Rambam here that we've seen, is that to assume that that's all the Torah is, is just a book of rules and that there aren't other significant stories and ways of meaning um, is not to see the Torah correctly. 
and that even this list, even the seemingly meaningless list, according to Menashe, has the ability to be incredibly meaningful and that we're supposed to be looking, right? If, if we don't see in the outer garments of the Torah the meaning, it's our job to go find it. I think it's a great reminder of, of worship of God, Avodah Hashem in general, right? There are days that are going to feel more rote. There are days that are going to feel more like chapter 36. And yet we still persevere. It's still part of our, our holistic uh, religious experience. Not every single day is going to be the ultimate high of a Rosh Hashanah davening or, you know, on, on some kind of uh, Hippo de Dut, uh, meditation experience. But even these moments, these drier moments of, of the chapter 36 are important and not only important, but they're holy and God is there too. And it's our job to go find it. So with that, um, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, I, oh, we ended just on time. Fantastic. Um, I'm happy to take some questions or comments here, but um, otherwise, thank you so much for being with me here this evening. I hope that some of it was enlightening, interesting, hopefully thinking about a chapter that maybe you would have totally fell asleep in and sure, um, and seeing that has the possibility for lots of meaning and can be uh, a great way to be thinking about how do we approach lots of difficult things um, that seem to have not so much meaning in our lives. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophia. Wishing you and everyone else here a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, that was beautiful, thank you. Thanks, Razi, nice to see you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, beautiful. Great ideas. Thank you. That was a wonderful share, really enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to just say one thing, which I think you may have mentioned, but uh, needs to be emphasized. And that is that chapter 36, I think is, seen as counterfactual history and counterfactual history is, is, it, is often something that's despised by people who don't understand its importance and the, and the but our commentators seem to have appreciated the importance of it, it's their importance Do you agree absolutely yeah i think i mean i think it's like a fun exegetical challenge right like as as rabbinic jews if we see something that doesn't fully make sense right away. We, we almost see it as like, oh, great, let's let's dig deep. Let's <laughs> look at this at multiple angles. But I also think that that term, the counterfactual is great. I think that, that goes with maybe what my fascination with the mystical understanding is of like this world that could have been if, uh, if that one hadn't been destroyed. Um, I think that seeing that as counterfactual, that we are this world of midat harach, mimenat, midat hadin, and can works you, well with that. Please remind, who was it who, who said that, that the world was originally created by the Midat Hadin. Where, where, where is that? Is that, the... that was in Rabbeinu Bachia. Um, I believe I can tell you what source it was. I think. Oh, my, mine doesn't, is not going to do that, but it's in the, the mystical underpinning section. Um, well, that, that's such a powerful idea of Rabbeinu Bachia that presumably he, he, get, he gets it from another source. I, I, yes, I can't he says that. at the beginning that it's Divrei Kabbalah, so I think that I think that it's there. We also have the Midrashic understanding about the destruction and creation of the worlds, but this idea of the Midat Hadin, Midat Harachmim, um, both him and the Zohar are the first places to, to see that. Well, thank you very much indeed for making me. Thank aware. you. Thank you for coming. Professor Cohen, your hand is raised. Hi, Sophia. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic shiur, both in terms of content and method, and I enjoyed every second of it. I'm so grateful. Um, I'd like to make two comments, one of which I, I hope will be a little reassuring and the other perhaps a bit enlightening. Uh, don't worry so much about asking the same question as Menasha. <laughs> it's okay. As far as far as I, I understand these things, I think uh, your, your motives are pure. And so there's an important distinction there. So <laughs> don't worry so it. much about that. Um, second, very small point. I, I think um, that when the, I mean, his question and the Gemara that answers the, the uh, problem of What's the Pasuk having to do with Ruvain and the Dudaim? Oh, yeah. I'd love an answer to this one because I'm fascinated by it. 
I think the problem is not the Dudaim, mm-hmm. but Ruvain went in the days of the wheat harvest. Why do we need to know when he went? What does the wheat harvest have to do with it? And that's what that's what is is getting picked up on. And I think that's what the Gemara then goes on to try and figure out, ah, that's got to be teaching us something. Mm, that's good. I mean, I still feel like the, their answer is somewhat of a, of a cop out. Like, I mean, I, I would hope that, that, you know, good people don't steal. But I do think that's right, right? They, why didn't they quote the rest of the Pasuk? I think that's a great read that, that they had to mention that part at the beginning. So that's great. Thank you. There you go. Anyhow, thank you again. Thank you. Nice to see you. Likewise. Be well. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Bye. So Peter, that, that one other thing that I was thinking, which I messaged you about, but I don't know if you saw, is how that first Gemara reminds me of the Ramban in the story of Saran Hagar, where he says that the punishment right, of Sarah and Avraham mistreating, or Sarah and Avraham mistreating Hagar is that Hagar's descendants will oppress the descendants of mm-hmm. Sarah and Avram, right? And there you have a very similar paradigm, right? A future enemy of the Jewish people, right? Is in some way, you know, oppressing us because of how our ancestors treated their ancestors um, in, a, in exactly the Midah, Kinei, Midah. Yeah, that's great. That is, it's that, it's even like the, that Esav and Yaakov can't live together also seems to be bringing back the Avram and Lot. There's nothing is new, right? Everything is, all these things are repeated. Um, and it shows that injustices are repeated and there's ramifications, which I think I think is important uh, for all of us. I, I think you might be interested to know that in my book, Legal Friction, I point out that the Dudaim are the re, are an allusion to the Adom Adom Hazet. They are the parallel to that. And they are the Mida connected Mida of Adam. Oh, that's great. And it, you'll find it in my book, Legal Friction, if you have time to look at it. Amazing. I, I'm going to check it out. Thank you. Are there any other remarks that people want to share before we wrap up? I'd like to thank you again because it was really, really good. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, I guess that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Sophia. I will close the Zoom now. And again, wish you a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And be in touch if you'd like. Thank you, Sophia. Shabbat Shalom. Bye.